folks. Morning. Um, hope you all had a good plenary session. I was working on this, so because I'm running behind schedule like everybody else here too. Uh, the presentation is, I called it what, precision agriculture and blah, blah, blah. It's really phosphor G on the farm. I think it is. Mm. Oh, two mics. Mm. You didn't tell me to wear two mics. <laughs> Is that better? No? I think I'm going to prom. Is that good? No? Can I just scream? Does that work? Okay. How's that? Whoa. I'm Batman. Um, hope you all had a good plenary session. Blah, 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 introduction. This is FOS4G on the farm. Um, let's just get into it. Who are you? My name's Todd Barr. I'm a spatial data scientist. Much like Coke and, or Coke, Pop, and Soda, grinders and hoagies, different regions had different words for things. Uh, so in DCIBA, Geospatial Data Manager, <coughs> excuse me, or in San Francisco, it'd be something like a uh, Ag Data Infuser Sherpa, but job titles. This sign is located outside of Lawrence, Kansas. One Kansas farmer feeds 128 people in you. I've passed this sign hundreds of times in my life when I was a kid. Reading my monster manual old, but dad was driving us to Kansas City. First time I remember it, it said 40, 49 people in you. So in the 20 odd years, it's almost tripled. Um, for about 20 years, I lived in DC, doing defense contracting, DHS stuff, all sorts of work. Got really sick of it. Thought about leaving spatial a couple years ago. Because all the contracts were the same. It's basically SharePoint administration with maps. I was really bored. And then I discovered precision agriculture a big data problem with an actual solution that's spatially based. And I fell in love with it. So much so, I moved to Florida. <laughs> right down here, where there is nothing. But all this through here, that's all farmland. All citrus, oh yeah, and alligators. That, that's my new morning commute now. That's the crowds I deal with. On a, on a weekly basis, not kidding, I see at least one alligator roadkill every week. It's a bit different. Florida at night. So you have Miami, Fort Myers, Tampa. This whole area through here, all this is sugar cane, citrus, and cattle. People don't associate Florida with agriculture. It's beaches, old people, retirement, and you know, bath salts. But, <laughs> but Florida has a huge agriculture market. There's a, a red square right here that you can't really see. But citrus? Sugar cane and cattle. Cow, cows in a swamp. When I saw, the first time I saw cows in the swamp, I thought people were hunting alligators. And that was their bait. But no, Florida has year round free range cattle because it doesn't snow and there's lots of grass. So, yeah, it's a different place. Um, last slide on Florida, I promise. So it's a big, it's a big thing in Florida. 15, basically, 15% 15 of all jobs in this state. $1.48 billion a year of state revenue, increasing because of California and their collapse of a, of a citrus market. And so let's talk about that. What's the farm of tomorrow going to look like? Now, this is current production. We have to grow by 70% in the next 20 years, 25 years. Actually, it's 25, 35 years. That's plenty of time. We can figure this out, right? There's water issues, drought, 
again, California. It's just, it's like a nuke went off. It's, uh, the amount of crops lost in California is insane. And we have land issues. Like Mark Twain said, buy land, I'm not making any more of it. But no one told the Chinese. So they decided to build some, but that's mostly for bases. And it's a long time before we're growing, before we're growing potatoes on Mars in our own poop. Now, with climate change, we have no idea what's actually going to happen. California could fall in the ocean. Florida could, Florida could flood, and people would actually get a bath. But overall, it's all up in the air. And I know you're concerned. You have right to be. But I have really good news. We're going to data the shit out of this. Mm. Mm. So, but how does GIS fit into this? GIS, in farmer speak, doesn't mean geography, it means grower. Grower information service. We're just maps. It's based in their, it's an agriculture's DNA. There's no difference between doing analysis based on a tabular data or spatial data. It's all just data to them. Is where we should be. Not, ooh, maps are special, I made a map. Nope. It's part of the process. As you can see here, this is a map of a farm. Very accurate. We used a, we used a parrot drone to get this. Um, but, yeah. But everything on a farm has location. Sub-centimeter, not sub-inch. Using RTKs, every one of these vehicles is not driven by a pilot. It's driven by an auto steer. So it's like the freaking Terminator universe out there. There's drones flying thing, these giant machines just gobbling up the earth, all without human intervention. There's a guy in there, but he's playing Candy Crush or something. <sighs> Cute story. So they took me out and had me drive uh, one of these big tractors, right? 10 tons of metal, high up. Turned on the auto steer, and I couldn't steer, the th I couldn't steer it. I couldn't touch the wheel, because as soon as you touch the wheel, you take it back over. It's the hardest thing to do. You just want to grab it, because there's a ditch. Oh, no, it steers itself around. It's amazing. Big tractor, big tractor, drone. This is really neat. To watch these guys fly and do flips like an air show every day. But all this stuff, all this data collection, data analysis, from remote sensing, LIDAR, it's all based on fundamental data. Guys in the field on ATVs, taking readings, taking coordinates. Soil samples for your for management zones, Fences for where the fields actually exist. And the most important thing, an A-B line. Now I know what you're thinking, what I was thinking when, I, when this came up. What does A-B stand for? Does it stand for agron agronomy business line? What does it stand for? Nope, A to B. Very simple, very direct. And here's some, some scouts in the field. These scouts go out in the field in the ATVs, taking coordinates, soil samples. They also dragged, um, Big things behind that detect the uh, conductivity of the soil for pH balance and that kind of stuff. That's really intense work, especially when you're dealing with like 200,000 acres. But you can't do it by drone, you got to do it by hand right now. Taking that data, we create what are called manage management zones. Each one of these represents a different soil, soil type or fertility based on what the farmer, farmer wants to see. So, in one field, we've got multiple different kinds of management zones. And the tractor has to know that when it's planning. So this management zone here gets one type of seed. And then as soon as it clicks over this centimeter, it clicks to a different kind of seed. So they get maximum yield out of each, out of each field. Because the, pl the plants are designed to grow in that environment, or in that soil type, or with that nutrient level. Okay. Field lines. Fields are really, knowing where your field ends and begins is really important for automated vehicles because they could drive into a gully or drive into a ditch or any, or any number of other things. This is a U.S. sugar field down in southwest Florida. Their, feet, their uh, overall farm is about 200,000 acres, size of Manhattan with all the boroughs. It's a closer look. As you can see, so fields are always kind of funny shaped. They're never exactly, uh, well, some are, some are rectangle, but some are like, like Nevada, right? And a tractor has to know how to go through this, being auto-steered. 
because if it's not, your AB line is off. And if the AB line is off, every inch that's off can cost up to a bushel, a, a bushel of pass. So each time these guys are off by an inch, it's costing the farmer money, losing food, and over the years, that could equate to millions and millions of pounds of uh, tons of food. Here's an example. These, there's a pilot in this one. But this is a sugarcane harvester. This is a sugarcane. You can see over these dant, dant drills. They drill down and just pull it all up. And nobody's, the guy's just sitting in there. It drives itself. It'll go around and go down another field. No human intervention needed. Unless, of course, something goes wrong. This is actually from a bad AB line. I sold this from Trimble's site. So the auto steer was working correctly. The AB line was off, and boom. Uh, $500,000 gone. Now comes the fun part. What about the farmer's data? The farmer drives a tractor. Well, not really. He hires the guy to sit in the tractor while the auto steer drives it. And that is connected to a large Wi-Fi network. The farmer owns this part, all of this. He owns or leases a tractor, and the Wi-Fi is his thing. The Wi-Fi connects to the internet. Oh, Shiza. Goes to a third-party cloud-based solution, usually the hardware providers. So this tractor is generating, an average tractor generates right around 200,000 points of data a day. All that goes into the internet, into, the internet, into a cloud solution. And then whoever the hardware provider is puts together a web platform and an API and sells the data back to the guy who generated it. This is neither good nor bad. It is a current business model. We are working to change it, but it's not there yet. And the kicker is the API. So you have a, you have a tractor it's made by one company. Your equipment inside is made by another. You're dealing with two APIs, with different data standards, different timing. It's a nightmare. And it's not OPA at all. It's all curated. All that data. Oh, yeah, and drones. They also collect data. Lots of it. And they spray fields. For the scouts go into the field, find an area that needs, that needs just a slight application of pesticide. Or you'll fly the entire field collecting remote, remote sensing data. As we're learning, if your, if your farm is bigger than about 30,000 acres, Drones aren't worth it. You got to go satellite. And satellites collect, you know, much larger sloths, like the entire states. And there's sensors that sit in the field. And all these things are generating data that falls in my freaking lap. It's amazing. Every aspect can have an impact on the rest of it. And you don't see the impact in years. You see it in days, hours, daily reports. It's amazing. And again, it all comes down to the scouts. But the farmer today, this is what it's going to look like in 2050. Well, the iPad will probably be see-through. And the barn might not be red. But all this stuff is happening now. The, soon be, there will be autom automated, uh, automated tractors, automated everything on the farm. That's all great, Todd. What exactly are you doing? Why did you move to Florida? Well, I like beaches. <clears throat> I came, when I came to work the first day, I had very little idea what was happening. Um, I found out that I get about a billion rows of data a day. Okay. 99% of that has spatial attributes. Okay. None of the data is stored on site. You've got to access it through multiple APIs and bring it all together. Okay. And the APIs aren't from the same company, so they're in different data formats, different standards. Fine. I can't get a legit data download, meaning everything in CSV or whatever kind of format without a three to four week turnaround by the provider. Oh, and not all the data that's captured by the tractor is available in the API. Oh, and also in Florida, it's always August. And this is exactly what I did. It's like, oh, I have all this on my lap. What am I gonna do with this? I have no idea. I just had to do something. So what do you always do when you have a big data problem? You just freaking install Mongo somewhere and start harvesting. 
Mm. Mongo, the Python, uh, some Python scripts, just grabbing all the API, all, all the data I can get my hands on, dumping into a giant Mongo bucket. Two weeks later, I had a Mongo bucket. That's it's literally like quadrupled in size. It's just nuts. I still have services catching up from four years ago. Then I had all this data in just there, so I had to figure out how to do it. So I started pushing it over to Post and started spatializing, as I, as I say. But in order to get the uh, people on board to move to Post GIS, I called it GRSDE. So the old school ESRI guys were like, oh, it's an SDE, this is just different. Exactly. Mm. Mm. So over time, spatial brand X went away, and I got all the analysts to start using Q. This is six months of me pulling my hair out. But it took a while, and I could finally breathe. <sighs> and look at what I did. Mm. I'm currently in a bubblegum and bailing wire solution because I'm a lone, I'm a lone wolf on site. And I'm just kind of fighting the fight as I can. But the future looks bright. We're, we're starting to migrate from uh, Mongo to something called PhiloDB. PhiloDB is based in Cassandra with amazing spatial hooks. And as our testing shows that it's going to be our solution. It provides quick and rapid access to, to big unstructured data sets, which is what I'm dealing with all the time. Uh, what? F-I-O-D-B? F-I-L-O. Yeah, phyla. It's like, like, the, like the pastry. Not to be a, okay. Got some fun. Now I gotta be a Debbie Downer. We have failed this community. Your average farmer and grower, I've been to multiple growers. They have tons and tons of data. And a consultant came and said, I could do that for you for $45,000, and then he leaves. Farmer has the data, but no expertise. So they, they start to lose trust in the IT community, in the spatial community, and all of us. This is 4% of the GDP of the US, 15% of the GDP of the world. It's a huge market. They need us. They want to, they, they understand what we can do. It's part of, their, part of their process, part of their DNA. We need to step up. But the future is bright again, as long as your rows are straight. Because everything comes down to these rows being straight. And the first day you ever show up to work on a farm, that's what they'll tell you 8,500 times that first day. If the rows aren't straight, who cares? Looks awful. Had to send the kids out there to go, to go follow the field. And any questions? Anyone? You in the back, of course. Um, <laughs> it was too long and I didn't catch it. Can you repeat the question, please? Or just condense it so I can remember it because I'm old and crazy. Acres. Mm -hmm. Well, on our farm, on, on one of my client's farms, um, we started flying drones. This is a test. And we got, when we started doing too much of it, the process of actually putting all the, knitting all the data together became a little too time consuming. So it's really a speed thing. And drones do great quick turnarounds. Like, we need these eight fields done today because there's a greening problem on this one tree with light. We need to fly LIDAR. Guys, I've a drone in 20 minutes. But like for huge swaths, it's always better to do, right now, it's better to do satellites. Is part of that satellite because it's multispectral? No, just because you get a wider area. Okay, but you don't need, you could use red, green, blue, and that'd be fine? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, our, our drones are, our drones are EBs. So they're, they're uh, battery driven. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, we have, uh, we have when we go out, we take six. I, uh, we, we do multiband spectral in EVA stuff, yeah. We also, we also do a lot of LiDAR. Mm -hmm. Let me show you. I got a picture in here from a recent poll. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's the baseline. It's like okay, this area is reflecting a bunch of you know IRA at rad, so this place is good. Oh look, there's a big green spot. There's an issue there. The whole kit and caboodle. This is a this is an orange grove we deal with. Um, these trees are like 150 years old, so try to get that into a tree inventory. And we want to know that they're straight too. Um, but we're working a lot in the in the nurseries up north, where we're actually working. Where we're Building a building a business process around this, but this is a this is a high level thing, and this is a ground showing the actual biomass and crown captures. You can see the trees have been harvested. They're all see how they're all flat. That's because a big device comes by and just buzzes them, and it cuts off the crown, and all the fruit falls off. And these giant school buses with the back cut off, called goats. Guys go, I pick up the fruit and throw it in the back of the goat, and the goat drives away. It was weird because when I first moved there, I was like, why are these used school buses floating around? Oh, they use them for farming. Any questions about Florida? No? Can you that, please? No, this is, this, this is done with the guys on ATVs. This was done by UV, UAV. Well, except this one was this was done by a plane, and this was done on ATV. So, what is the dominant software stack that you find that you use in this? Open source. Is it? Depending on the size of the uh, of the of the farm, like U.S. Sugar, U.S. Sugar, they have an ESRI license that they're not using now. Um, farmers don't like paying for stuff. If they, and they want someone there working with their hands, putting it together for them. It's mostly custom one offs or mm -hmm. farms. Every, it is. Not, 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 to be, not to be punny, all I have been throughout this entire presentation, it's ripe for us. <laughs> oh, I was, uh, I was playing around with, uh, we started playing around with Cassandra itself. Because of the backup, you, know, easily, you can replicate. Because we have so much data, if we lose, you know, it's just gone. And then I was listening to a podcast, and this guy's like, and we made something called PhiloDB, and it has spatial hooks. So I'm like, oh, I'll go download that when I get to work. Because it's awesome, because I don't have anyone to, anyone to answer to. I'm going to do this. OK, go do that. I'm going to go play with this for a couple weeks. Go. But yeah, so we've been, PhiloDB, I, I don't know how it's all put together, obviously. But I think in the back end, it's actually using PostGIS hooks to, because you can do point and polygon analysis with big data with it. So, 10? 10? No, sorry. Okay. Anything else? We haven't got to that point yet. Um, got to walk before we can run. We're, uh, like anything else, you gotta slow, because the guys up top know what they wanna see, they know what's cap what's, what, what they're capable of. Then you have these guys in the field who are just, they have to, have to string them along a bit, so they, they're they going. In the end, um, the idea is just to have this all being pumped through some of the BI framework, so it's just part of the whole process, or they can see everything when they, when they want to see it. But right now, we're not there yet. We, we literally started from zero. Well, that's not a lie, I had a computer. So, and then we just work from there. Where are you running all this stuff? Amazon. We don't have anything local. Well, yeah, security's a joke. After going from DOD, DHS world, I could just walk into a building? What fool, what Tom foolery is this? I could leave and not have to sign out? Nice. Chris Ray? Can we cut the recording? Mm. 
No, it needs to be answered. I just don't want it on record. <laughs> oh, sorry. I'll just yell. So what's happening is the biggies, the big hardware providers, the GPS company and the large tracker company, are fighting it hard for open data because it's part of their business stream. Additionally, and this is really fun, the hardware providers know the yield the second it hits their, it hits their databases. So I have, as there's a guy sitting, let's just say in Iowa, with a database with all the, all the crop yield at his fingertips. He'll know the productions for next for next year. He can play the futures market if he wanted to. It's basically going to start trading. And the laws haven't caught up with the uh, with the uh, with the tech yet. But anyway, there's two companies. Farm Logs is one. All their data. They're like at the end of the day, here's all your data you wanted. We're not going to put it behind a wall. We're not going to put it behind anything. Just take it. And there's another another startup, Agrox, I think, that's doing the same thing. But right now, most of the data is in a silo that I, I generate the data, I pay for, equipment, for the equipment, I put, up a, I put up a huge wireless network, and I can't get all my data? F you. No, I can tell it's okay, because it's... Um, any other questions? Right, right now, right now it's being pumped through, uh, through Spotfire, but we're working to make it a little more robust than that. Like I said earlier, we're just not at that point yet. We're getting there. Uh, I don't do that. I outsource that, so I don't know what they use. I have too much on my plate, so. For my growers, <laughs> I would I would actually go through and compare the yields from different years, based on whether or not it had auto steer on or had auto steer off. So they so then the the pilot could actually see how much damage you're doing to the crop lines. By oh I can drive within a centimeter. No you can't. You think you can, but you can't. Anything else? Good question. So the farmer owns the tracker, not the software. Um, so when the yield data goes in, when, if the far, if, and it, it's basically set almost automatically most of the time, but if it's out of range, it comes back and does a big, does a big data dump. But uh, most, of that's held by the, most of that's held by the companies. Yeah. Worldwide. Okay, worldwide. Mm -hmm. Nice. <clears throat> Five. Everybody good? Well, everybody satisfied with my presentation? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>